I tuned into this for the first time a couple of weeks ago when you were doing Workman Clark and Harnell Wolf, which was of great interest to me personally. Um, and it occurred to me, I've been a volunteer for the Irish Football Association in a variety of different roles for over a decade. And under the current president's tenure, uh, they kind of started a, a remembrance service each year in the ground in the George Best suite. And it was something they invited lots of the football family to. And I was struck, uh, having listened to, to your session, um, generally what we got was the names, maybe a wee bit about they were killed in action, and that was it. And I'd really like, I think that service itself would be enriched, and I would like to know more about them, who they were, a bit about their background, maybe the regiment, and other information. And Nigel had some really interesting information about the people at Workman Clark and the people at Harn and Wolf. And also, um, even if there's a, a, Nigel was able to find a photograph for one of these, and that makes it richer again. There are other links to the Irish Football Association. Captain James McElveen Wilton, who later became the president of the IFM, was a German, had a link to the First World War. And there are other links locally where there's a cup in the Fermanagh Western League called the Mercer Cup, which is named after a gentleman who fought in the Great War and survived. So there's lots of history that connects. But this is particularly about people who lost their lives in the Great War. So I'm interested to see how Nigel has added to what we have. Okay, I hope nobody was shocked by that. I just thought that um, with the two sound effects going from the sound effects from a stadium or from the terraces to the sound effect of the trenches would be a good way to start this evening. In the aftermath of the Great War, um, some rugby and cricket clubs erected memorials. For example, the North of Ireland and Knock Rugby Clubs have their memorial tablets. Cliftonville, Cliftonville Cricket Club has a tablet and the Craigor Cricket Club um, designated their grounds as a war memorial and erected war memorial gates, which are now sadly no longer there. The Ulster branch of the Irish Rugby Football Association, Football Union rather, erected a memorial arch at Ravenhill to commemorate the men who had played rugby who had served and died in the war. However, to the best of my knowledge, there's no corresponding or there was no corresponding approach within the association football circles. More recent times, this has been partially rectified with memorials being erected by four local clubs, Linfield, Distillery, Glenavon and Portadown. The Glenavon Memorial takes the, the, the format of a, a mural, which is a bit different and I think it's actually quite effective looking. A few weeks ago after a previous uh, talk, Conrad Kirkwood sent me a list of 30 names of Irish League fatalities and asked if I could put some meat on the bare bones about the men, which I have done. Using the war memorials and newspaper searches, I now have a list of 47 names and I've identified the death details for 40 of them. Now, some of the others that I haven't, they could be men who were listed in the newspapers as casualties and somebody doing research has maybe thought, oh, casualty, fatality, we'll stick them on our list. There's also uh, situations where some of the newspaper reports referred to men being connected or a member of a certain club. So you might get something like so-and-so was a member of Cliftonville Football Club. And of course, that, that doesn't mean that they were a player. It just means that they had what we would now call, a, I suppose, a season ticket. They were members of the club, but they weren't actually players for the club. So those sorts of ones would need to be treated with a bit of caution. Additional material for this talk has been obtained from the Linfield website with which Johnny Jamison's involved, and also a website I came across called Northern Ireland Footballing Greats. And it has a, a database of a lot of Irish Ulster men, Northern Ireland men, who played football, whether in home leagues or in England and Scotland. And it's quite fascinating the details they've got about various men. So some of the information I've got here tonight have come from that website. And I'm not, whenever I'm going through the talk, I'm not, not gonna say, I got this from so such and such, I got this from um, um, such and such a place. And a lot of the other information is from general research and newspaper research. So let's start off with looking at some of the players. And I'm going to be going through the players in alphabetical order. Before I do, you'll see that the Stillery Football Club has a memorial tablet. The last name on the list is Second Lieutenant John Spencer Dunville, VC of the First Royal Dragoons. Um, now, he was, it was the Dunville family that owned um, the distillery. 
and owned that football club. But I'm not certain that he was a player for the club. Um, so, and it does say at the top, in memory of players and officials. So I haven't included John Spencer Dunville because I'm looking at footballers, men who played football, rather than officials at football um, clubs. So the first guy I'm going to look at is William John Brawley, who played at outside right for Distillery Football Club. And in April 1913, he had a trial with Aston Villa over in England. It was unsuccessful. They deemed him to be not quite up to, up to scratch for playing in the English league. He was born on 17th December 1884 at Newhill in Ballymoney to Robert George Brawley and Ellen Sophia Caldwell, being one of their nine children. His father was a master tailor and the family was living at Office Street in White House in 1911. William was recorded as being a general labourer when he married Mary Watt on the 25th of December 1906 at St Anne's Parish Church in Belfast. In 1911, William, Mary and their son, who was also called William, were living at Pittsburgh Street in Duncairn Ward. William Brawley uh, was deployed to France with 2nd Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers on 23rd August 1914. That implies to me that he was already in the army when war broke out um, because it, the, the first Inniskillings, or the, sorry, second Inniskillings were a, a regular battalion um, and it would be inconceivable that somebody could enlist on the 6th of August and be in France by the, 20, by the 23rd of August. So my assumption is that sometime between 1911 and 1914, William Brawley had enlisted with the regular army. He held the rank of corporal when he was killed in action during the Battle of Festubert on 16th May 1915. He was 30 years old and on the memorial tablet uh, for Castleton Presbyterian Church on York Road, he's also commemorated on the Le Touré Memorial in France. He left a widow and three sons under the age of nine. Mary Brawley was awarded a weekly pension of 20 shillings and sixpence from the 6th of December 1915. The rate was reduced to 10 shillings and sixpence per week when Mary Brawley married Henry Miller on the 3rd of April 1916 at Eakenhead Memorial Presbyterian Church. In other words, the element of the pension that related to supporting her was lost because the, the new husband would be um, deemed to be, she would be a dependent of his rather than being a dependent of a dead soldier. The second one is Bernard or Barney Donachie. He played at inside forward for several teams in Ireland, England and Scotland. He had four spells at Derry Celtic and spells for Belfast Celtic, Glentoran, Hibernian, Manchester United and Burnley. In 1914, he was playing for Dumbarton Harp. He was capped by Ireland at international level and represented the Irish League 11. Bernard Donachie was born on 23rd December 1882 at Walker's Place in Londonderry to Edward Donachie and Bridget Doherty. And they lived at Long Tower Street. He gave his occupation as footballer when he married Sarah Maguire on the 8th of July 1914 at St. Columba's Roman Catholic Church in Londonderry. And that's the first time I've ever seen footballer recorded as an occupation, either on a marriage registry entry or in the census. So it's quite unusual. Barney had been recalled from the reserves to the 4th Battalion um, when his only child, Bridget, was born on 6th, 8th September 1914. He's just been recalled from the reserves. His wife gives birth. He was posted to the 1st Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and took part in the landing at Y Beach on the Gallipoli Peninsula on 25th April 1915. Barney sustained gunshot wounds to the head towards the end of the campaign and was evacuated to a hospital in Alexandria. The Allies withdrew from the Gallipoli Peninsula in early 1916 and his battalion, which was part of the 29th Division, was deployed to the Western Front in March 1916. The 29th Division um, was positioned on the left flank of the Ulster Division during the Battle of Albert, and Barney was killed in action during his battalion's attack on German trenches south of Beaumont Hamel on 1st July 1916. He was 33 years old and is commemorated on the Thiepval Memorial in France. His widow Sarah Donachie was awarded a pension of 17 shillings and sixpence per week, and that was from February 1917. 
and she also received a war gratuity of eight pounds and 10 shillings in September 1919. David Drennan was a goalkeeper who played for Distillery, Cliftonville and Linfield. He was born on 20th June 1877 at White Abbey to James Drennan, who was a yarn bundler, and Eliza Hayden. He was employed as a linen warehouse man um, when he married Hester Burroughs on 5th October 1899 at Ballysun Presbyterian Church. And they were living at Manor Street in Court Ward in 1901. Um, David had played for Woodvale Distillery in Cliftonville before signing as a professional for Linfield in October 1899. He remained with the Blues until May 1902 and then played for Cliftonville in the 1903-1904 season. In 1911, David was a warehouse man and living at Agra Street in the Ormo Ward with Hesse and their four sons. According to newspaper reports, David returned to Ireland from Canada in 1914 and was working at the Belfast GPO when he enlisted with the 18th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles in April 1915. So at some stage between 1911 and 1914, David had gone to Canada, presumably to, to seek a new life, set up home, and then his wife and children would have, would have joined him. But at the outbreak of war, rather than joining up with a Canadian unit, he decided to head back to Ireland to join up with a local regiment. He was deployed to France with 11th Battalion in October 1915. He was killed in action on the 1st of September 1916, aged 39, and is buried in the Russian Farm Cemetery at Hainut in Belgium. He's also commemorated on the memorial tablet for White Abbey Congregational Church. Hester Drennan, or Hesse Drennan as she was known, was living at Vernon Street in Cromock Ward when she was awarded a pension of 23 shillings per week from March 1917. The pension was for herself and three sons under the age of 16. Hester also received a war gratuity of five pounds in October 1919. John Edmondson was a Linfield player. Uh, he was a son of John Edmondson. I haven't been able to locate his birth details. And he was employed at Queen's Island as a slinger when he enlisted with the 14th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles on 18 September 1914. He served on the home front throughout the war. He was 40 years old and stationed at Ballykindler Camp when he married Margaret Jane MacDonald of Begg Street on 6th January 1916 at St Anne's Parish Church. A son, John Henry, was born on 26th May 1918 at Begg Street. John Edmondson died of septic pneumonia at Fargo Military Hospital on Salisbury Plain in England on 5th November 1918, aged 42. His body was brought back to Belfast for burial in the Roll of Honour plot at Belfast City Cemetery and the burial took place on the 10th of November 1918, the day before the armistice. He doesn't have a specific grave and specific headstone and his name is recorded on the memorial wall. He's also commemorated on the Harland and Wolf Queen's Island Memorial. Commonwealth War Graves Commission um, records that he was serving with 7th Battalion when he died. But at the time of his death, 7th Battalion, part of the 16th Irish Division, would have been in France. And I think actually by that stage, they had transferred into the Ulster Division. His service papers record that he was with the 3rd Reserve Battalion. And the, the various Reserve Battalions of the Ulster Division, the 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th Battalions, had been posted to England in early 1918 and then they had been all amalgamated together into the 3rd Battalion. So in essence, the 3rd Battalion at that stage was largely an Ulster Division Battalion. So again, we've got a situation here where it's possible that Commonwealth Wargraves or whenever the, uh, the fatality details were being collated, 17 has been misconstrued as seven. And so he's been recorded as being 7th Battalion. This is Patrick Hagen, and we've got two photographs here, one of him in army uniform and one as a player. Um, he was a forward and played for Linfield between 1899 and 1905. He had two spells with Hibernian on either side of a spell at Brentford. And he also played for um, Port Glasgow Athletic between 1908 and 1910. I'm not sure which football kit um, he's wearing in the, the photograph, which comes from that Northern Ireland Footballing Greats website. Um, 
In the 1903-1904 season, he represented the Irish League 11 on three occasions. Patrick Hagan was born in October 1879 at Canongate in Edinburgh to Patrick Hagan and Margaret Nolan. He served as a medic with the Royal Scots during the Second Boer War. And you can see that his, he's got his Boer War uh, medal ribbons on in this photograph. He married Mary Ann O'Connor on 18th June 1904 at a Roman Catholic church in Edinburgh. He was working as a boot finisher when he enlisted with the Royal Scots or re-enlisted with the Royal Scots on 11th August 1914. His wife gave birth to a son, George Albert, on the 27th of August 1914. So a couple of weeks after he, en he enlisted, his wife gives, gives birth. He held the rank of sergeant when he was deployed to France on 11th May 1915. And his son George Albert Hagen died of pneumococcus. Right, I'm going to skip that bit. He died of peritonitis on 10th July 1915 in Edinburgh. Patrick Hagen was killed in action on 14th July 1916, the first day of the Battle of Bazentlin Ridge, which was the second phase in the Battles of the Somme 1916. He was 36 years old and is commemorated on the Thiepville Memorial in France. Mary Ann Hagen was living at Coburn Street in Edinburgh when she was awarded a pension of 24 shillings for March 1917. The pension was for herself and three children under the age of 16. Mary Ann also received the war gratuity of £12 in January 1920. Leslie Houston played for South End Rangers for many years, that's a team um, in the Ballymena area, and then for Linfield Swifts. He was born on 13th November 1884 at Ahockle to John Houston and Mary Elliott. His father was a shoemaker and the family was living at Alfred Street in Ballymena in 1901. Leslie married um, Lizzie McFall of Patrick Place in Ballymena on 16th June 1906 at Harryville Presbyterian Church. In 1911, Leslie, Lizzie and their two children were living at Henry Street and Leslie was working at an aerated water bottling plant that was operated by a local pharmacist called Houston Lancashire. Houston Lancashire was also very heavily involved in recruitment in the Ballymena area. And in fact, his pharmacy shop in Castle Street was a recruitment centre. Leslie Houston was recalled from the reserves at the start of the war and was deployed to France with 2nd Battalion Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers on 23rd August 1914. Lizzie Houston gave birth to a son called Leslie on 12 September 1914 at Salisbury Square in Ballymena. Private Leslie Houston died of wounds at the second clearing station on 31st of October 1914. In other words, he never lived to see um, his son. He was 29 years old and is buried in the Balliol Communal Cemetery at Nord in France. He's also commemorated on the Roll of Honour for Harryville Presbyterian Church. Lizzie Houston was awarded a pension of 22 shillings and sixpence per week for herself and four children under the age of 16. She also received a war gratuity of £5 in June 1919. Leslie's elder brother, John, served with the Royal Irish Rifles during the Great War and was awarded the Military Medal in November 1917 and a bar to the Military Medal in February 1919. He had played for Linfield and Everton before the war and was an Ireland international. He survived the war. Robert Howe played for Glenavon in Lurgan and he was born on 29th November 1888 at Coke in County Tyrone to William Howe, who is a policeman, and Mary Jane McKeown. They were living um, at St Ives Gardens in Belfast at the end of the war. Robert attended the Tamla National School and like his father he joined the police force. He was stationed at Queen's County, then at Church Place Barracks in Lurgan, and finally at Cullingtree Road Barracks in Belfast. So it was when he was based in um, the Church Place Barracks in Lurgan that he played for Glenavon. He re resigned from the um, RIC in 1914 and emigrated to Canada, where he was a prison official when he enlisted at Gulf in Ontario on 11th January 1915. He was allocated to the, to the 34th Battalion of the Canadian Infantry and arrived in England on board SS California 
in November 1915. He was transferred to the 23rd Battalion in February 1916 and then to the 13th Battalion in the field in May 1916. He sustained shell wounds to the abdomen and thigh and died of his wounds at Number 10 Casualty Clearing Station on 3rd June 1916. He was 27 years old and is buried in the Lichtenthuk Military Cemetery in Belgium. Richard Irwin was a goalkeeper for Glenavon and he was born on 18th May 1885 in Waringstown to Samuel Irwin and Margaret Maguire. He was a weaver when he married Margaret Copeland on 21st November 1913 at Macherlin um, Church of Ireland. Before the war, Richard Irwin was a drill sergeant in the Waringstown Company of the Ulster Volunteer Force and um, was an Orange Lodge secretary. He was an all-round cricketer playing for Waringstown's second team regularly and assisted the first team in the 1911 final against North Down. He enlisted with the North Irish Horse in 1909 and at that stage it was a militia regiment so it would have been on, on um, home duties. He held the rank of Lance Sergeant when he was deployed to France on 20th August 1914. During the war, the, um, the, there was less need for cavalry, and so the North Irish horse was dismounted. Some of them went into the Corps of Hussars, but many, like Richard, transferred to the 9th Battalion of the Royal Irish Fusiliers in September 1917. He was killed in action during a major raid on the German trenches near Havencourt on the Cambrai front on 3rd November 1917. Sergeant Richard Irwin was 32 years old, and is buried in the Neuville Bourgeonval British Cemetery in France. He's also commemorated on the Memorial Banner for Waringstown LOL 883, along with eight other men, including um, Major Colonel Waring. Margaret Jane Irwin was awarded a pension for herself and her child of 22 shillings and 11 pence per week from May 1918. She also received a war gratuity of 17 pounds and 10 shillings in November 1919. That was higher than most people would have got because he had been in the army since 1909. He was also um, a senior NCO when he went to France and then he served through um, much of the war and that's why um, his war gratuity was considerably higher than others. Staying with Glenavon, William Kelly was a goalkeeper for the club. He was born on 12th July 1881 at Crawford Street in Partick to Joseph Kelly and Anna Kelly. He was a weaver and living at Victoria Street in Lurgan when he married Ellen Boyd on 28th October 1913 at Shankill Parish Church in Lurgan. They had two daughters, Jane born in March 1914 and Emily in February 1916. William was a member of Britannia LOL 24 and Mount Horeb RBP 68. He enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and was deployed to France with 9th Battalion in October 1915. He was killed in action during the attack in the Ancre Valley on 1st July 1916, aged 34. He is buried in the Ancre British Cemetery in France and is commemorated on the memorial tablet in Hill Street Presbyterian Church in Lurgan. Ellen Kelly was awarded a pension of 18 shillings and sixpence from January 1917, and she also received a war gratuity of eight pounds in September 1919. Don't have a photograph of James Lamb, so we're just gonna to have to suffice with his medal index card and his cap badge. He played for Portadown. He was born on 25th May 1888 at Carrick Blacker Road in Portadown to James Lamb and Sarah Chambers being one of their 11 children. His father died in 1910 at the age of 40 and the family was living at Henry Street in 1911. He was a linen weaver and he enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers, being posted to 1st Battalion in France on the 8th of November 1914. He was killed in action on 21st March 1918 during the German Spring Offensive. He was 29 years old and is commemorated on the Pozier Memorial in France and on the memorial in Thomas Street Methodist Church in Portadown. Samuel Long played for distillery in the late 1890s. He was born on 9th January 1877 at Cusick Street 
in the Windsor Ward. His parents were William Long and Mary Ross. He was a clerk when he enlisted with the Imperial Yeomanry on 17th January 1900, and he served in South Africa from 3rd March to 7th June 1901, being discharged on 12th June 1901. The Imperial Yeomanry was not a, a regular army. It was, as, it's, as it says, it was a yeomanry, and it was the forerunner of the North Irish Horse and the South Irish Horse. He re-enlisted with the Imperial Yeomanry on 18th September 1901 and served in South Africa from 19th October 1901 until 4th July 1902, when he was discharged at his own request. He received the King South Africa Medal and worked for the Transvaal Police Force thereafter. He enlisted for war service, service with the South African Infantry and was serving with the 5th Regiment in German East Africa when he was killed in action on 20th June 1916. He was 39 years old and is buried in the Dar es Salaam War Cemetery in Tanzania. And he's also commemorated on a family memorial in Dundonald Cemetery. Moving away slightly from the more mainstream and well-known uh, teams, Samuel Lowry played for Willowfield United, whose home ground was probably the recreation ground off the Craigor Road. This is now Gibson Park, the home of Malone Rugby Football Club. He was born um, on 18th June 1885 at Richardson's, Richardson Street in the Orham Award to Archibald Lowry and Ellen Bridges. Samuel was employed as a baker for the Belfast Cooper Cooperative Society um, on Ravenhill Avenue. And he married Harriet Louisa Scammell on 15th July 1914 at Willowfield Parish Church. Samuel was a member of the Ravenhill Road Volunteers Loyal Orange Lodge No. 580, Willowfield Unionist Club, and he was a member of the East Belfast Regiment of the UVF. Samuel enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and was a corporal when he was deployed to France with 8th Battalion in October 1915. He was mentioned in dispatches by Field Marshal Sir jo John French's dispatch, published in the London Gazette in June 1916. Samuel Lowry was a sergeant when he was killed in action on 2nd July 1916, aged 30. He is commemorated on the Thiepville Memorial in France and on the War Memorial Organ in Willowfield Parish Church. In September 1916, the London Gazette reported that he had been awarded the Distinguished Conduct Medal for his actions in July 1916. The citation reads, for conspicuous gallantry in action, he led his platoon right up into the enemy's line, where he collected stray men near him and reorganized them under very heavy fire. Before he retired, he gathered many wounded and put them into places of shelter. He always set a fine example of coolness, cheerfulness and pluck. He has been wounded. Samuel Lowry was not recorded on the memorial tablet for the Willowfield Unionist Club and does not appear on the modern replacement obelisk on the on the Craigor Road, nor is he recorded on the nearby Willowfield Battalion UVF Memorial. So although he was part of the East Belfast Regiment UVF, he may not have been part of the Willowfield Battalion, he may have been part of uh, another battalion. Ellen Lowry received a pension of 13 shillings and sixpence from March 1917 and a war gratuity of 10 pounds and 10 shillings in November 1919. Wesley Maltzed played for Derry Institute and later for Linfield and was also a junior internationalist. He was born around 1880 in London Derry to William John Maltzed, who was a building contractor, and Letitia Jane Wilson. I've been able to find birth registrations for all of his siblings, but I just cannot find a registration for Wesley Maltzed. Some online records that I've seen um, record that his name was John Wesley um, Maltzed, but um, I haven't been able to find a corresponding entry for a John Maltzed either. Of course, there could be varying, uh, variant spellings of his surname, including Maltzed and Maltzed and so forth, um, but to date, I haven't been able to, to tie that one down. In 1911, he was employed as a clerk in a shirt and collar factory, and he was living at Cottage Row in Londonderry. He enlisted with the Royal Inniskilling Fusiliers and held the rank of Sergeant when he was deployed to France with the 10th Battalion, the Derries, in October 1915. He was subsequently transferred to the Machine Gun Corps 
and was a company sergeant major when he was commissioned still in the Machine Gun Corps on 26 September 1916. At some stage he was transferred to the 11th Battalion Royal Irish Rifles and he was a second lieutenant with that battalion when he was shot by a sniper whilst on patrol on the 11th of November 1916. He was reported as, as missing and his death was confirmed in May 1917. Wesley Maltzed was 28 years old and is buried in the Sanctuary Wood Cemetery in Belgium. He's also commemorated on um, War Memorial tablets for Christ Church, Church of Ireland in Londonderry and Foyle College. He's also commemorated on the Roll of Honour for the City of Derry Presbyterian Working Men's Institute. And that was the group that started the Institute Football Club. Um, I only came across reference to this Road of Honour basically this week whilst preparing for the talk. And so far I haven't been able to track down whether the Road of Honour still exists. I have consulted with a couple of people up in the Maiden City, but that's, that's so far nobody has been able to, to um, say where it is or indeed whether it still exists. Harrison McCloy um, played for Cliftonville and was Honorary Secretary of the Irish Football League. He was born on 12th December 1883 at Vicinage Street in Wilt Clifton Ward to Harrison McCloy and Arabella Shields. He was educated at Campbell College and this um, portrait comes from the Men Behind the Glass project. After leaving Campbell College he entered his father's plumbing business which was based in Talbot Street. Following his father's death in 1905 Harrison McCloy Jr continued to run the business. He enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and he was a corporal when he was deployed to France with the 14th Battalion in October 1915. In March 1916, local newspapers reported that he had been hospitalised for a week with bronchitis. That would imply to me that he had been involved in some sort of gas attack at some stage during his service in France and that had resulted in an underlying um, weakness in his respiratory system. He was a company quartermaster sergeant in the tank corps when he was killed in action on 21st August 1917. He was 33 years old and is buried in the White House Cemetery in Belgium and commemorated on the War Memorial tablet for May Street Presbyterian Church. He's also commemorated on a family memorial in Shankill Graveyard, which I only became aware of this week. Richard Moore played at left half for Linfield in Ireland. He was a member of the Linfield side that won the Irish League and Irish Cup double in the 1890-1891 season. He also played in all of Ireland's matches in the British Championship of 1891. Played for Dundalk while stationed in the town with the Royal Irish Rifles and appeared for them in a 3-2 defeat by Bohemians in the 1897 Leinster Cup final. He returned to Linfield for the 1897-1898 season. Um, he was born on 18th January 1867 at Davison's Row in Ballymacarrick to Richard Moore and Mary McLarnan. Richard Moore enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles on 7th October 1885 and was stationed at Fermoy in County Cork when he married Ellen Walsh on 14th February 1893 at Fermoy Parish Church. He was stationed in Malta between March and November 1894 and then in India until November 1896. He was discharged, discharged in August 1906 with 21 years of service. At the time of his discharge, he was living at Ribble Street, but he was a live-in caretaker at the Bank of Ireland Chambers on Anne Street when he re-enlisted in 1914. That's the building that's on the corner with Oxford Street. So it's that um, building that's just over the Queen's Bridge. This is him later and somewhat enlarged in girth. He was a quartermaster sergeant when he was deployed to France with 11th Battalion in October 1915 at the age of 47. He was commissioned as a second lieutenant with the Royal Irish Fusiliers and posted to, to the second garrison battalion, which was part of the 10th Irish Division. He died, he died while serving on the Salonica Front on 29th October 1918, less than two weeks before the armistice on the Western Front. He was 51 years old when he died and he's buried in the Kirchkoi Hortikoi Military Cemetery in Greece. He's also commemorated on the Bank of Ireland Memorial in Dublin. 
Soldiers Died Great War records that just that he died, which usually means that the person had not been killed in action or died of wounds. Just recorded died would generally be men who died of illness, died of accidents, and so forth. In November 1918, local newspapers reported that he had died of dysentery. The Bank of Ireland Rule of Honour book, which was published in the early 1920s, also records dysentery as the cause of death. Some online sources record that he died in an air attack. Um, I don't know the source for those online uh, entries, but the fact that at the time of his death and shortly after he was, it was recorded as illness and dysentery would in, incline me to believe that um, he did die of illness rather than um, being killed in action. David James Sloan played for distillery. He was born on 14th March 1891 at Moscow Street in the Shankill Ward to John Sloan and Isabella Hunter. His mother died of tuberculosis on the 1st of June 1893 and his father married Agnes Spence on 29th November 1893. Obviously at that stage he had a young family from his first marriage and he needed a wife to look after the children whilst he went out to earn his living. David was a fitter at the Queen's Island shipyard when he married Mary Ethel Dealey on 1st June 1912 at Holy Trinity Parish Church in Belfast. That was in the Unity Street area and was destroyed during the Belfast Blitz. He enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and was deployed to France with 14th Battalion in October 1915. He held the rank of Lance Corporal when he died of wounds on the 24th of October 1916, aged 25. He is buried in the Balliol Communal Cemetery Extension in France and is commemorated on the memorial tablet for Donegal Street Congregational Church and also on the Harland and Wolf Queen's Island Memorial. Although the Congregational Church in Donegal Street closed down several years ago, um, the war memorial plaques for both the First World War and the Second World War are still on, on display by the, the church that has taken over the building. Mary Ethel Sloan, <coughs> pardon me, Mary Ethel Sloan was awarded a pension of 25 shillings and five pence per week from April 1919. And she received a war gratuity of nine pounds in October 1919. This is John Wilson who played for Glenavon Reserves. And it's one of the few photographs from the Great War Ulster newspaper archive, which features a man in um, sporting kit. Um, again, I'm assuming this is the kit that would have been worn by Glenavon Reserves during, uh, during pre-war days. He was born on 11th November 1888 at Claytown near Lurgan to John Wilson and Elizabeth Dowie, or Dewey. It's spelled D-O-U-I-E, so you take your pick. In 1911, he was stationed in India with the Royal Irish Fusiliers, and he was deployed to France with 2nd Battalion on 22nd August 1914. He was killed in action near Dickey Bush on 24th January 1915, aged 24. John Wilson was struck in the chest whilst trying to drag his injured platoon commander, Lieutenant William Leonard Ringrose Hatch, out of a dugout. Um, the battalion war diary records that he was recommended for a gallantry award, but that was not to be. He is commemorated on the Menengate Memorial at Ypres and on the war memorials for two churches in Lurgan, Thomas Street Methodist Church and Shankill Parish Church. I want to finish off with two footballing brothers who died. I don't have photographs of either of them. So again, I've used the medal index card and their cap badges for this slide. They were the sons of Thomas Cummins and Mary Ann Cummins of Hill Street in Lurgan. Both played for Glenavon and both are commemorated on the war memorial in Shankill Parish Church in Lurgan. Moses Cummins enlisted with the Royal Irish Rifles and was posted to the 1st Battalion on the Western Front in January 1915. He was killed in action on 19th July 1915, aged 24, and is buried in the Y Farm Military Cemetery in France. He was the fourth Glenavon player to die in the war. Thomas Cummins enlisted with the Royal Irish Fusiliers on 26th July 1911 and was deployed to France with 1st Battalion on the 22nd of August 1914. He was exposed to poison gas at some stage 
and was stationed on the home front from January to August 1916, whilst he recovered um, his health. On being passed fit for active service, he was deployed to the Salonika front with the 6th Battalion, and that was on the 27th of August 1916. In July 1917, he was admitted to hospital in Malta, suffering from lung congestion. Thomas was discharged due to sickness on 3rd September 1917 with the Silver War badge, and he died of pulmonary tuberculosis on the 5th of March 1919, aged 24. Whilst Moses Cummins is commemorated as an official war fatality on the Commonwealth War Graves Commission database, Thomas Cummins is not. As his service papers record that tubercule of the lung was the cause of his discharge, Thomas qualifies to be included on the Commonwealth War Graves database. And I submitted a case to the In From The Cold project just yesterday to get his name added on to the, um, that database. It could take a couple of years, but in due course, Thomas Cummins will, after over a hundred years, be officially commemorated as a war fatality, as is his right and honor. So this brings the formal part of the talk to an end, but Johnny Jemison is going to finish the presentation by reading a poem. For those of, you, those of you who don't know Johnny, he's part of the setup at Linfield, and works, I think, with the academy players. He's also been heavily involved in the research and remembrance of Lin Linfield players who died in the two world wars. So I'm going to um, close this session. Linfield's glorious dead, and it's about the young men who played for this great football club, and we're proud and privileged to wear the blue shirt of Linfield Football Club. As the gaffer give his team talk at Windsor Park one day, his players, they sat and listened to all he had to say. But standing in the corner, these young lads came to light. Some dressed in ghostly uniforms, they were an awesome sight. Now the gaffer, he was speechless as this young lad turned and said, Mr. Healy, we once played for Linfield, but now we are Linfield's glorious dead. We are the spirits from the trenches, and back to Windsor Park we came. We played in many finals here, and we won immortal fame. We were part of that famous charge on the 1st of July morn, and as we rose up from the trenches, we were cut down like corn. Officers and privates fell in that great charge of fame. They lie there side by side now. Their rank is just the same. David, we lost so many players. Some were my boyhood chums. Young lads cut down by shrapnel and some be a sniper's gun. In the bloody fields of Flanders, where many of these brave young Linfield players fell, as they moved up towards the frontline trenches, it was like entering the gates of hell. They were taken in their early youth, away from the team that they loved. They served their king and country, now they serve their king above. From the city boy in the shipyards to the country boy in his plough, how they all once played for Linfield and they sleep together now. Captain Gibson said to David, please sir, don't be afraid for you will always have behind you the boys of Linfield's old brigade. And as the piper leads you out at Windsor, Hold your head up high with pride, for they'll be standing there behind you, all those Linfield players who died. But the hardest part has came and gone. That's when these heroes returned home and missing from the marching ranks, our dear beloved sons. And as you stand at Windsor, 
and you see the pitch so green, please just remember them and think what might have been. Though in death, still loyal and true, just a glimpse of their ghosts in red, white and blue. Fortune favours the brave. Thank you.